Good afternoon, everybody. This is Alexis Gingerella reporting in from Recruiting Daily. Uh, here to introduce some awesome people for an awesome webinar today on Recruitment Marketing 2K17. Uh, quick shout out to our sponsor, Symphony Talent. You can find some of their information right here. SymphonyTalent.com, at SymphonyTalent underscore on Twitter. Be sure to follow them. Head over to the website and check them out. A few little housekeeping tips for those of you that may have not joined us before. You are in listening mode only, so you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. However, you do have the option to ask some questions on your control panel, so please feel free to do so. Um, and also, if you're following along online, please tweet at us, hashtag rdaily. Um, you can also put questions on Twitter as well, and I'll be looking out for those along the way. If for some reason we do not get to your question during the webinar, I promise we will follow up with you afterwards. And also another friendly reminder, this is recorded, so you'll be able to watch it over and over again uh, at your pleasure. So uh, today's experts, uh, we have Michael Dreyer uh, from Symphony Talent. Please be, feel free to follow him as well on Twitter there. You can see his handle at Dr. Dreyer. And our own Bill Borman from here at Recruiting Daily. Follow him at Bill Borman. And I'm actually going to hand it over to Bill to kick things off and go over today's agenda. So without further ado, Bill Borman, everybody. Yeah, hi Lex, hi Mike. Um, thanks everybody for listening in. Um, as, as Lex said, my name is Bill Borman. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm the Managing Director at Recruiting Daily and also an advisor to a, a, a wide range of tech companies in this space and companies hiring. I'm really excited about today, today's webinar in the preparation. We've been, we've been having a lot of Lot of chats. One thing I promise you when you do a webinar with me, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint. So we don't have lots of slides with lots of bullets. It's very simple headings and discussion. Um, Mike's one of the, the, the more informed people in our, in our industry. So I'm, I'm delighted to be having a conversation with him that, that, that we could share on, on some key points. That coming to this topic really came around. I think everybody's heard the clamour uh, over the last period of time and the, the, the sensational headline of recruitment is marketing. Um, something that frustrates me, I don't think recruitment is marketing, but I think marketing tactics and marketing technology should become an integral part of, uh, an integral part of recruiting and recruiting thinking, which is why we want to have a, a sensible discussion on it today. And I hope you'll be chiming in with your questions. If you've got questions while we're speaking, jump in, put them in the question bar or tweet us at hashtag our daily and put in the questions. And we're going to try and answer those questions as we go along rather than a, a formal Q&A session at the end. But today's agenda that, that there's really um, some six key areas we want to look at. The first one is what do people want to know? So those folks out there who you're trying to reach, what do they actually want to know? Um, uh, and so we'll kick straight in, uh, in on that. So, Mike, um, uh, uh, over to you. D this subject of what people actually want to know, I think the starting point for anyone when we're talking about recruitment branding, yeah, we have personas of drawing up who people are, but what do people actually want to know when they go looking for you online or that, that they're considering a company as a possible destination of choice or they're looking at a, a, a job and thinking about applying? What are the things you, you think they want to know as a, as a candidate or an applicant? Well, first off, thanks for, for inviting me, Bill and Alexis. It's great to be here. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of our clients around the country, and, and hopefully I kind of bring that, that unique perspective of, of what we're hearing from our clients, what, what they're hearing from their, their target job seekers and candidates. Uh, so, you know, to answer the, the question very simply, um, from, from what we're hearing and from especially what our point of view is, uh, they're wanting to hear very similar types of information and consume that information in ways that they're accustomed to. Uh, and that means as consumers, um, you know, they're using social, they're obviously on their phones all the time, uh, they're reading reviews from peers, they're talking to other people about products, they're receiving really highly relevant personalized experiences with consumer brands. 
so in a nutshell, you know, what we're hearing is, you know, we want to receive the same types of information and the same types of ways from, from companies that are trying to recruit us or, or at least attract us uh, as, a, as an ideal place to work. Um, so it, it really isn't uh, overly complicated from our standpoint. We, we recognize that just in today's day and age, um, you know, people react to re recruitment, employer brands, just like they would as consumers, as people that are, you know, potentially going to buy something. Uh, it's just obviously a different message, but the, the want uh, to, and the need to have, um, you know, authentic messages, uh, you know, um, shared content from, from people who have experienced uh, the product or the brand or the company in this case. Uh, and to be able to get that information very quickly and easily and fast and, and in seamless brand experiences, that's kind of what we're hearing, and that's that's frankly what we're all about at Symphony Talent. I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, Mike. It's something I'd pick up on from... We had a conversation yesterday for anyone listening in, and at the end of it, I went away and thought, you know what, um, it's really true around the point that we talk about it, we put people in boxes who are in the job seeking process. So we might call them job seekers or we might call them candidates. We might call them applicants. We might call them any number of things. Usually we'll measure them in some kind of metric through data. Um, it's pretty easy to forget at the end of the day it's people. Uh, and everyone in this process from recruiters to hiring managers to uh, to, to people who are, who are interested are people. and. and we consume our we, we consume our content and our messaging in very similar ways about all the things we're doing and, and all of those buying and influence decisions. Is, is there anything in particular, Mike, you're seeing um, in terms of res responses that um, job seekers or candidates or people looking at career sites are really responding to? Is there particular content types that are performing better than other? Yeah, absolutely, and and you know, part of that fundamental issue that you just mentioned is it was kind of created, um, you know, by us in the industry when we talk about technology products. Um, so so we're kind of at fault for that because you know if you look about ten years back, um, you know that's really when the technology, the shiny tools era, was ushered in. Uh, when we talk about you know what's out there from a re recruitment technology standpoint, and it's not even really an era; it's just kind of how things are now. But um, you know, about ten years ago, you know, if, if you were a large organization and you were now being presented with these technology products that seemingly would you know fix all your problems, um, the and, magic fix. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think what it's done is, in some respects. Uh, it's enabled kind of the bad process elements of, of you know, being a job seeker today, being a recruiter today. Um, we've, we've tied ourselves to technology more. That's made it a much more impersonal experience overall. Uh, and on both sides, not just for job seekers, but for recruiters as well. And that's what we're trying to get back to is, and I love your, your point about, you know, making this really about people. Because uh, that, that really is what it's about. It's about, you know, engaging with people uh, and, and qualifying them and ensuring that they're the right people for your organization and, and uh, you're right for them. And, and um, I, th I think to answer your question quite blunt bluntly, what are we seeing uh, people really react to in the market from a job seeker standpoint? You know, when we talk about candidate experience especially, uh, and just kind of the, the the overall careers website experience right now, in, in most respects, is a very generic uh, process, awesome. generic experience. And, and clients who have started to embrace concepts like personalization, uh, serving content and, and jobs and, and things like that to people based on known data on the person, that's what we're really seeing uh, is, is starting to really take off for, for, for our clients and for job seekers and getting them much better experiences and, and getting them along the way in, in much more efficient ways. So what I'm hearing from you is we're really getting to that point of what's working is not is um, not so much what do people want to know, but what do I want to know? How do how do you make this um, how do you make this whole experience personal and around my needs 
um, rather than everybody's needs, because everybody's needs are not the same. And I think we've we've been down a long phrase of, I use the term quite a lot, employment branding, when I'm looking at things and saying, actually, we've made a lot of organisations look exactly the same with very similar, very, very similar messaging and really trying to reach out to the many rather than reach out to the one. And I think once, once we start thinking a bit more about that technology, that, that experience, that personalised being part technology, part process, part people, um, we really move on. So, let's do, Alex, do we have any questions in at the moment or do you want to move on to the next slide? And if anyone's got anything they want to ask about at this point, please just put that, put that, in, put that in the sidebar for us. Yeah, actually, uh, Matthew uh, Marlinski, hopefully I'm saying his last name correctly, wants to know what type of tools you would recommend using uh, to serve personalized content um, to active and passive job seekers based on the known data that you've found. Okay, so Mike, anything you want to recommend in there? Obviously, we'd say, we would say go, go have a look at Symfony, but any, what types of tools should, should people be looking at? Well, I mean, when you when you kind of think about it, you know, fundamentally, we, we come in, when we talk to our clients, um, you know, it, it obviously starts with with their business needs or business challenges, because that ultimately is what we want to to solve for, and that's why we don't put clients in a box and try and fit everyone in a in that sort of generic box. And and um, for us, typically, it 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 starts with identifying. Uh, what those challenges are. We look at data, we look at metrics. Um, data is, is a big part of what informs everything that we, that we do from a strategic standpoint. Um, lagging metrics are, are typically at the core of, of what we try to solve for, but leading metrics are also really important as well because we want to obviously leverage our strengths. Um, and that all kind of goes into, you know, what tools you should consider. Um, but we, we believe wholeheartedly at Symphony Talent that um, we, we don't really start with the tools and w where do they fit within our current process. You know, if we're talking to a, to a hiring organization, what we actually do is we, we, ch we try to challenge those, those clients, those hiring organizations to think about not what you do today, uh, but, but what the idea scenario would be, what the idea uh, what the ideal um, process uh, or experience would be for not just your job seeking uh, population, your target candidates, but also your recruiters. And we use the word nirvana a lot. So don't think about what it, you know, what it is that your process is today and, and how do we continue to enable that and hopefully solve for that with tools, but what is it really that we want to do and how do we want to get there and what would ideal state be and how do we craft uh, a technology solution strategy around that. So that that's you know, that's kind of where we start. It, it really starts with, with having some of those deep conversations with clients about, you know, what is, what is it that we have access to from a data perspective right now? You know, what are we trying to solve for? Uh, and then not just look at the strategy from, from the short term, but also, you know, kind of look at it from a long-term perspective too. And is this something that we can iterate on uh, so that we can solve for future problems that we, that we know are going to happen? And, you know, the easiest way to kind of look at it is just kind of think about, um, you know, what technology or what gadgets that, you know, you may not use today that might be sitting in your closet, right? Um, and you think about why those things are sitting in your closet and you're not using them. And typically it's because, you know, one, they're not solving for whatever it is that you thought you were going to buy it for. So maybe you didn't do the proper discovery uh, before you did buy it. You were just kind of initially enamored by the, you know, the flashy, shiny element, um, or two, it's, it's been replaced by something better. And, and that ultimately results from just not really knowing what the long-term strategy is and kind of outliving the life of what it is that, that you purchased or, or decided to go with. And, I, think, and, I think that's the age-old challenge, really, with that. It, it, yeah. it, it's, it, it's keeping things current and relevant. I, I think the other, yeah. the, the other point of the, of the question Matthew's asking is how do we actually personalize things? And I think that's looking at um, continually building a relationship beyond one visit to a career site and, and, and collecting information and, uh, as, you, as we go through the experience so we can actually start to um, we can 
target people in the right way and think about marketing to an audience of one. So Lex, if you if you want to move the move the slides on, um, which really leads into this, which is the question we talk about a, a look. We've talked a lot about storytelling um, as being important, but my question, Mike, is, um, and something I think about a lot, is is it the story or is it the teller that's important? Well, it's both, right? I mean, it's, it's what you're telling from a content perspective, and is that authentic? Is it true? Is it relevant to the user? Um, but it's also the mechanism or the person or whatever it is that's actually delivering it. Uh, and ensuring that you know um, whoever it is that's delivering that message, if it is technology in some cases, if it is a human being, that you know that's being done properly, and it's also part of a, a, an overall connected brand experience. So I think it's actually both. So it's a, it's a little bit of both. But when we're talking about the the tenor, for me, I'm looking at it and saying, right, okay, the first, there's two things I look at if I look at any content in the marketplace. Three things. One is, it's the headline that's going to bring me in. And my first question is, if I'm coming on a headline, is the place I land relevant to what brought me in, which is around the clickbait argument. And the second thing I want to look at is, who actually created this or who's telling this story? Is this someone who, who actually knows that? For me, when we're talking about recruiting process, the challenge is, when the message should come from a recruiter and when the, me when the message should come from a peer. Um, and, and I think the key thing in, that we're seeing in, in, in content now is that um, is this peer-to-peer -peer content of the, of the creation of, uh, uh, there's two things I want to do with content. One is I want to be able to make an informed decision. Um, and my decision is really about whether I opt out rather than I opt in. Uh, am I going to stay here, go to the next call of action, do the next thing you're asking me to do in the process, or am I going to exit? And the other thing is, do I actually believe what I'm being told? And a lot of that comes down to to the peer-to-peer -peer messaging. Now, we talked a bit, um, and whenever we talk about content, we hear a lot of the buzzwords um, coming in from... Um, authenticity, transparency, all that kind of thing. In, in simple terms, what does that really mean in terms of content, Mike? Well, I mean, we know, you know, from our own experience and our own measurement that, you know, shared content is, is you know, converts people four times more than paid content. So the, the, the delivery mechanism or the teller in that case is, is an incredibly important part of, of the overall success of that. Of that. Um, but th the story itself, uh, from our perspective as well, is is just as important. I mean, uh, we 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 don't typically, you know, recommend just just kind of sharing jobs. You know, um, it, it's more about um, things that are are particularly interesting to the to the listener and and how that's relevant to them. Uh, real stories about people in the organization. Real stories about things that the organization is doing that's relevant to whoever you are sharing that too and and that can be shared by peers it can be shared by recruiters as well um, but but the overall you know goal is is to get people interested it's not to um, you know drive them to go apply to a specific job right there then and there we've, we've got other met methods for that we've got advertising we've got you know SEO SEM all that good stuff um, but but sharing content and telling those authentic stories is more uh, of, a, of a true brand element to, to really kind of uh, spread that authenticity factor. So how do you be, uh, how do you get these two things, which, which, which can sound like contradictions to a lot of people in, in a lot of ways, how can we be authentic and be a brand at the same time? Well, because your brand uh, should be authentic <laughs> to begin with. I mean, authenticity uh, should be should be part of your overall strategy. I mean, I, I don't think you would ever want to just purely put things out there that you know aren't um, you know things that are that that are indicative of who you are as a company. Um, and that's why it's important to do things like EVP discovery, EVP research, and and really um, you know discovering what the DNA of your company is and what what your people really live in and. Um, you know, live by and, and you know, exude as, as employees that could be advocates for your organization. So um, the, the, 
the advertising message is, is supplemental. I mean, it's part of the omni-channel experience. It's not something that's an either or. It's something that hopefully is an extension uh, of what that shared content is and vice versa. The shared content should uh, be an extension of, of your, your brand advertising as well. Absolutely right. So I just want to recap to one point you made right at the beginning because I think it might have been lost in the conversation a, a little bit. Um, you said that organic content from the tracking you're doing is four times more effective than um, the paid content. Yeah, and, that, and that's in line with industry standards. I mean, that's that's kind of one of the uh, the foundations of uh, you know of social content, sh social sharing is you know when, when content. Uh, is shared from from peers, person to person. Um, it converts people, or those people act on it uh, in in ways that is much higher, four times higher than a, the same person essentially receiving a, an advertising message that's a, that's purely a just paid post or an update or something like that. That's correct. Yeah, which I think is is really interesting, and this comes back almost to the original question: is is it the story or the teller? We could always add another sub question to that and, and say, or the share, is it the source which actually makes you look at something and, re and read it with credibility if you if you trust that person, which is the power of network, but also the power of organic con content of getting people to create and enabling people to actually create for themselves. Next, do we have any questions and can we move on to the next slide? I'm looking at a lot of the questions that are coming in, but, um, um, you know, is, is a lot of people, it looks like Kim uh, fans are, hopefully I said that right, Kim said, what What if it doesn't, you know, you're trying really hard to be authentic, but what if it's not coming across that way? Do you have any thoughts on the whole fake it till you make it thing within recruiting, or is it better to just kind of, you know, go with go with what you know? Fake it till you make it or go with what you know? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I'd come on, on in on this one um, really and say that there's a, few, there's a few things. One is, if you fake it, people are going to find out somewhere along the line. Um, you know, and you might achieve one objective in that you might, get, you might get people to apply for your jobs because you look like a great place to work and loads of fun and lots of, and lots of team. When at the same time, um, when at the same time, the, the end scenario is somebody accidentally gets a job somewhere where they don't want to work based on being sold a lie, um, because the attraction piece, the attraction piece was great. The story wasn't true when they turned up. So I, I think you have to get this bit of saying, um, you really, I, I, I have a I have a saying which always upsets the HR people who runs teacups, which is that, that, that there's that there's no um, bad culture. There's just bad culture culture fit and it's really a case of saying uh, we've been truthful in what in what we're showing people and is there no surprises when they arrive and we and actually what are we trying to achieve here and I think we've been driven um, and come in on this Mike please I, I think we've been driven um, historically by saying we just need to get more and more people to apply in the hope that some of them are okay what we're seeing increasingly by taking a content-led approach or a marketing-led approach is actually, no, we don't want lots of people to apply. We want lots of people to opt out because we want to end up with the, with less people of the right quality in the funnel for, further down the line. Yeah, and I mean, I think back, back to the original question, like how do we, you know, maintain authenticity if, you know, if we're not doing it well, you know, um, again, it gets if we're back not a great to company. right. If we're not a great company, or if that's not getting across, um, it, first of all, it's it's not an overnight process, right? I mean, it's something that is is a process of learning. Uh, we do tons of sentiment analysis, as I'm sure you do. So you you establish your measurement, uh, and you you act on things over time, cause and effect. So if people aren't responding to it, or if they think it's fake, then Let's figure out the why, and then let's let's determine what our strategy is going to be after that. And the way yeah, that we I do think that is, that is that a first, yeah, yeah, that first question is if we're thinking people uh, 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 think it's fake, actually, is it? Right. And is the message in the channels 
the same as the message that we're putting out there. And yeah, you have it, to align it, those things and get it right. Right. And is it is it the message or is it the, the teller? That's another good point there is to ensure that um, if companies are sharing content, obviously they know how to do that and they know how to respond to the response. They know what their social media policy. Lots of things go into the setup as well. Yeah, I, I also want to get that feeling all the time of am I talking to the marketing heads or am I talking to someone who's giving me a, a credit, credible answer? But we're really moving towards that that balance of content and conversation um, and having that, that social experience around it. Do you want to move on to the next slide, Lex, and then um, I'm conscious time is moving on. So we've, this question really comes from a position um, to you, Mike, of we get, we're becoming increasingly social in our um, attraction. We're doing more um, nurture. Um, we're doing more um, content peer to peer where people are where people are speaking to each other or, or, or we're generating that organic content. That's a, that's a very social experience in the attraction. Um, but the next question is really: Is our hiring process, or is the hiring processes that we see? actually social? Does the hiring process mirror the attraction process? What, what, what's your thoughts on that in, in terms of what you see? Well, and, and we, when we talk about social, you're really meaning kind of just people, right? People sharing I think information people and experience, it's not so much, a t it's easy to think when we say social, we mean technology. I, right. I, I don't mean that, right. although there's, there's tools involved in that process. But it's a very social, friendly person-to-person -person experience in terms of what we're proposing for attraction. Yep. Uh, I would say, in general, most organizations aren't currently carrying social all the way through. Uh, and I, again, I think it's, uh, you know, points back to, to a, in some cases, an over-reliance on the tools that are out there and, and just the process, especially with high-volume recruiting organizations. It's hard to, to attract somebody um, through you know, peer-to-peer -peer content, shared content, uh, and then to to kind of nurture that person through every step of the way. And it doesn't just stop at the application either. It, it should continue uh, after the person applies. You should continue to nurture people um, as they are, you know, waiting to hear back from you uh, with the status of that application, where they stand. Continue to, to sell them on the opportunity on the organization. Um, this is a job seekers market, you know, and we have, you know, in the U.S. here, we have, you know, pretty much unprecedented low unemployment. So it's a job seekers market, and job seekers, uh, you know, if you're if you're lucky enough and if you're good enough to get really good people in the door, you've got to keep them there, uh, or they're they're going to become interested in something else. Um, there's a lot of confidence today with job seekers to 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 find other jobs, to find opportunities. Uh, turnover has steadily risen since the recession, as we all know. So um, the nurture process doesn't just end at the application. It has to be continued all the way through, and, it, and you know, it has to be a process of um, learning more about the person after they apply to ensure that culturally they're the right fit, uh, in addition to, you know, from a domain skills perspective, they're the right fit. So it's, it's, there's many things that, that go into it. Uh, these these can be managed by technology in some respects. They can be managed by people in some respects. In most cases, it's a blend of both. But uh, it, it's it's a process that should be carried all the way through to the hire, essentially, or to the rejection. Yeah, I see that. I, I see this as being um, one is keeping up the dialogue and, uh, and communication. The other one is really um, tailoring and personalizing that experience. So as people are going through a process, you're giving them more and more relevant information, right from the point of when they first visit a career site to when they come back and revisit um, and come back again. You know who they are. You know where they've looked before. You're showing them. Um, you're personalising that experience, but that continues once they hit the once they hit the apply button. I think we see it almost as this brick wall where we come so far of being. We, we come so far of. Um, Giving people that good, giving people that one-to-one uh, -one personal experience, in, uh, and, and, and this is something I hear from people all the time when we're looking at the candidate experience awards. Is the organisation was all over me? They were sending me lots of emails. They were trying to hire me. They were calling me. They were all over me and giving me lots of love. And then the moment I actually applied for the job, 
that was the end of the process. I, ne- I, I never heard anything again, or the experience just stopped being social. And, and I think you have to look on it. I, I look on it as separating um, candidates and applicants as two different things. Candidates being people who are interested or con- connected with your brand, who are looking at things, who are coming to your career site, maybe signing up for your LinkedIn page, following you on Twitter, watching your YouTube videos, whatever it might be. Applicants are those people who've actually hit the button. They've, they've ended up at the destination of, of of the checkout, if you want to talk in retail terms, and they've gone, yeah, I want to apply for this job. I put my hand up, measure me against this job. Um, and I look at two different processes, both of which need to be personal. And what I see in a lot of organizations I'm looking at is that the candidate experience is becoming increasingly personal, but the applicant experience is becoming less personal. It's becoming much more about machine and barriers and less about and treating everyone the same, less about giving people that more tailored information and, and communication. And I think that's anyone listening in, that's something for you to think about, which is does your actual hiring process mirror your wooing process? You use the term nurture, and it, it's something I hear from a, a lot of vendors. I get a lot of emails saying, um, it's all about nurturing your pipeline. Um, what does that really mean, Mike? Well, I think it's kind of back to what you said. I mean, nurturing is 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 a continual process of of guiding people through each step of what that process is, and um, making sure that they feel uh, important, important and they feel welcome and they feel uh, informed, especially on on where they stand with with you and your company and. Again, that happens, um, you know, all the way through the process and beyond the process of applying. It should happen really um, to the point at which you know you ultimately welcome the person into your company or or not. And then, of course, from from that point on, post hire, that's also a separate nurture process. So, nurturing is is ongoing. It should happen each step of the way, and it should be something that um, organizations really think out uh, consistently because. Most companies, you know, that as part of their their brand message or whatever they put out there to to candidates. I mean, most companies generally, uh, you know, put messaging out there that that we care about you. We care about hiring the best and brightest in one form or another. So so nurturing is generally kind of part of what most organizations try to communicate. And you know, to your point again, some of the some of that nurturing kind of ends uh, at the point of application because you're, you know, you're now entering into. We've got you now. We've hooked you. Yeah, so we've got you. It's a different system. system a you different want system. us. We wanted you before. You want us now. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that I think that's something for anyone listening in to go away and have a look at and think about. Um, a nurture for me, despite a lot of what I'm seeing, it's not three emails. It's not a three. I think this is something that's kind of come out of the HubSpot thinking of it, it's a three email process of oh we send people three emails or regular emails, that's not nurture. Nurture is really working on building a relationship and using whatever tools necessary to communicate with people in the right way and give people, give, give people lots of options. So Lex, do we have any other questions and are we ready for the next slide? I think we should just go ahead on to the next slide right now, actually. We're going well. Things are going well. Keep it on. Next question. So um, we talked about candidates and applicants being something different. We, we give awards for can, the candidate experience awards, which I think generally really are the applicant experience awards um, when we look at it truthfully. It's, it, it's, it, it's looking at that applicant experience. We've talked about it a bit. Um, I don't know whether you want to add anything to it, Mike, but what should the applicant experience be? Again, back to, you know, kind of our opening remarks. I mean, let's let's not o- overcomplicate this. You know, let's look at some of the best um, buying experiences that we've all become accustomed to in the e-commerce world as consumers, and and let's think about why those are considered best in class. Typically, it's Ease of use, it's speed, it's you know integration, uh, it's all those good things, and it's carrying through that experience that got you there in the first place. It's carrying through a really great brand experience, being served relevant content, 
uh, and getting you to the point where we're going to continue that on through the applicant experience uh, and, and not make that, you know, this completely disjointed experience because we're now doing it, you know, using a different system or process. So let's talk in practical terms. <laughs> Somebody listening in, what can they do or what should they be looking at to um, measure and to improve their applicant experience? Well, I mean, some of the, the, the you know, so some of the obvious key indicators are, are you know, you know, candidate quality, applicant quality. Uh, you know, what is our application to hire ratio? Is it super high? Uh, if it is super high, does that mean we're getting a lot of junk into our ATS? Um, is our drop off extremely high? Uh, that kind of represents one of the fundamental challenges most of our clients have as well is is really determining where people drop off and, and what the reasons are for that. Uh, so, so candidate uh, for, quality, for the client, candidate. Yeah, you, you're dealing with a lot of clients, so um, across uh, across the board. What are you seeing as being the key trends or, or, or the specific spaces where where people are dropping off at the moment? And is that changing in any way? Well, I think certainly uh, the mobile experience is still not there. Uh, it's you know kind of become let's do the the full apply process uh, in mobile, and maybe it is mobile optimized, but it's still uh, incredibly tedious and just takes a lot of time and is you know just not not that great of an experience. Uh, but I think it kind of goes back to you know what is it that we really want to get from people anyway. Um, do we need to put people through a 20 to 30 minute process? Is that absolutely essential? Um, should we re-engineer that process and are there things that we can do uh, to, to make this much better, not just on job seekers but on our recruiters as well? Uh, and this gets back to that kind of that nirvana state that we try to ask clients to think about. Don't think about what your process is today because in all likelihood you're talking to us because it's broken. Uh, think about what it would be if you were applying for this job today. What would the ideal experience be for you as a job seeker that would make you really interested in this company? And if you're a recruiter recruiting yourself, what would it be that would make that experience as well um, emulate the job seeker experience uh, and make it just as good? I, I, I want to say, you know, have a, have a loo on that. And, and I think it's that point of the the applicant experience of looking at why why are people dropping off the the mobile conversation we we should really be having but we have to repeatedly um, you know we should just understand that now as, as the standard it, it should be easy but actually um, I did some work with somebody recently where we were looking at um, on quite a large scale where we were looking at um, mobile apply because that was the first thing we want to make our application process mobile once we got into it the issue we realized pretty quickly was not an issue of mobile, but an issue of apply. Our application process was just too long and too de tedious. And all we'd really done is go back um, 10, 15 years and take a paper form which we put on a computer in the form of an ATS. And now we were trying to take that same process from an ATS, um, asking lots of unnecessary questions for unnecessary information and, and taking too long uh, and trying to take that out and now put it on a mobile device. So we were actually making the experience, although we might be getting the tech bit right in terms of um, optimization at ease, we're making the process less and less relevant and harder and harder for people to apply. I, I think we really have to look at that in organizations and say, what are we asking for? Is it relevant? Does it flow in the right way? Is it a social experience? You're getting the inf are you getting the information easily? Um, e e easily, um, do you get the answers that you want? And do uh, do you actually need all the information on the first visit, or can you collect that once you've made that connection? So the sign up is really simple. I think looking at things like that when you talk about your consumer experience, you know, um, if I go to Amazon, they don't ask me to fill out a credit form before I'm allowed to be a customer. <laughs> um, so it's kind of crazy to me that we we do that in, in the in the employment experience. Any other thoughts on that, Mike, or, or any questions, Lex?
Um, I have, do have a question that came in from Shelby Atkinson, and she just was wondering if you could maybe give a little more uh, insight onto examples of personalizing the applicant process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's a great question. So you, you can personalize in, in different ways. Um, you can, uh, if, if we're just talking about practically, right? So person comes into your website, we have data on that person. Uh, we can collect additional data, we can cookie them. Uh, we can then serve personalized content to them based on that data. Uh, we can also use what's called profile-based personalization, which is um, essentially kind of a, a lead capture or an apply start, something like that, which is more login-based where, you know, we can start to ask for uh, bits of information, hopefully in, in kind of consumable chunks, so that we're not asking the job seeker to provide tons and tons of information up front like Bill was talking about, and then personalize off of that. And the way that we do it is with artificial intelligence. So um, we use AI to, to gauge candidate quality and relevance uh, based on who the person is, what information that we can gather, gather from the person, uh, and what we know about the types of jobs um, that the person is interested in or, or that is relevant to them based on what the, the company has done historically with similar types of jobs and similar types of candidates. So I'm not going to get too geeky on AI, but uh, in summary, we, we use AI to personalize that experience to people. It's, it's very similar technology uh, that you receive today as a consumer. It's looking at the combination of data based on your behaviors and, and patterns as a consumer. And it's really looking at the, the personalization is going around, you know, once we know a little bit about you, we should really change your experience. Um, so if we know, for instance, uh, what your job is and what you do, or we know what your location is. You know, I, I saw something recently which was collecting information on a, on a chatbot, which I thought was fantastic and simplistic. First thing you're asked about was your postcode. That's in the UK or zip code in the US. The moment you're providing your zip code, all of the answers of the content you, you see is localized to you. So that might start off with really um, start off on a wider geography in terms of country when you're talking about global organization and, and then a localized basis that the content you're seeing, if you um, if you're living in Seattle, the content images and uh, messages we want to give you, the jobs that we serve up to you, we want to be about um, ab about being in Seattle and people from Seattle rather than people in general. So that's a geography example, but then it might be around your skill set, the kind of content, if you're spending a lot of time on a on a site looking at a bit of information. But it's really looking at it and saying, how do we uh, coming back to saying how do we personalise and make this whole hiring experience one to one? Yes, we could use automation in it, but equally we can on a human basis, actually making sure we're dealing with people as people and understanding that they're, they're looking at something quite different. That's why I look at, um, I talk a lot now about IVP rather than EVP, which is employee value proposition being for everyone, the IVP being that individual thing. What, what, what's the thing that you want? What's the thing that I want? And that's something I try and look at throughout the hiring process is, is not just from a tech point of view, but from a personal point of view, how do I target um, towards your individual needs, your wants, your locations, and the things I know about you? So, so I'm not, I'm not treating you like a stranger um, when we've already met, which is really what we do in a lot of hiring processes. Lex, any other questions, or do you want to move on to the next slide? Let's go ahead, and we'll go on to the next slide. Go for it. What about the recruit? Yeah, so this is the other thing. We, 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 we give out awards for candidate experience. We've talked about applicant experience, but actually the biggest factor, we need to think about all users. It's something I get quite passionate about, but what about the recruiter? What does the recruiter experience have to be um, to provide to, to provide the, the, the opti to provide the best, the optimum performance? and the optimum experience for, for the candidate or the applicant. And any thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it gets back to what we were talking about. I mean, our, our industry is kind of partly to blame for this. I mean, we've, we've for so long kind of forgotten the recruiter and, and sort of overlooked them as well. And 
And in many cases, the tools that are out there have kind of reduced recruiters to, to being, you know, essentially database administrators, uh, where they're just constantly looking at lines of data in terms of candidates and, and the information um, that they're trying to get uh, on candidates and, and then trying to make educated decisions on who is the best fit for their for their requisition or you know their organization and and that's fundamentally the issue with with a lot of recruiter tools and why they have forgotten uh, the recruiter and haven't kept them in mind so when we, again when we talk about experience um, we, we don't limit that just to the job seeker experience we're not just giving uh, the job seeker personalized content we're not just leveraging artificial intelligence for the job seeker we're also doing it for the recruiter. We're leveraging artificial intelligence to take uh, a lot of that legwork out of, you know, human beings trying to conduct keyword searches uh, to try to find the right candidates in their database and we're, we're letting AI and machine learning do that for them so that they can focus their time on actually recruiting and creating that human element once again and getting back to the art of recruiting people and selling people on your brand and your organization. And that's absolutely my that's absolutely my hope is that as we automate, I think we can or we can automate a lot of the recruiting process. What I'm, uh, what we mean by that is it's not a threat. Let's let, let's automate as many of the tasks that we can. Let, let's let, let's make a, a, as much a, as much of the connecting process between um, anyone interested in our organisations and opportunities. Um, self-service, so that as soon as you trigger something, you trigger the next step. It doesn't require a middle person to do that. Um, and let's not look on that as being something that's going to reduce the numbers of recruiters or challenge recruiters, but actually give them more time, and more time to go into the things we've been talking about, top end of the show, I think, is that that personalization and, and that having time to get to know people. I, I'm always frustrated. I look at it okay, what do we know right now? We know that recruiters have more acquisitions to deal with than ever, than ever before. We know they have, they're getting more candidates in the pipeline rather than less because of the general nature of messaging. Um, we, and so we know, they're getting, we know that people are staying in jobs less time. Therefore, more and more jobs are repeating. Recruiters are only getting busier and busier whilst being given responsibility for all kinds of other things like candidate experience and time to hire and stuff like that, um, when actually what we should be saying is, okay, how much of this, how much of this can we automate? How can we clean up the process and get it right? Um, and anyone listening in, I'd say, right, okay, what do you want to, what do you want as a takeaway? Document your real process. Follow the paper in your organisation. What happens when a resume comes in? Is until somebody gets hired, and how much of that could you, how much of that could you actually automate, um, so that you have more time actually for, uh, actually for people. Uh, uh, anything to add to that, Michael? Any other well, thoughts on on the recruiter experience? I think you were kind of alluding to. I was just going to throw a question back to you, Bill. You, you know, AI automation replacing human beings. Have you been hearing that from your conversations? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we we hear it from two points of view. One is, one is you've got two choices. So if you have a hundred recruiters and you can automate eighty percent of the process, because you're taking out the admin tasks, um, and let's be honest about that. We, instead of having to change resumes or get feedback or shortlist or source, we can automate a lot of that process. If we do uh, do that, as an organisation, you've got two choices. If you have hundred recruiters, do you just say, okay? We can automate 80% of it, so let's get rid of 80 and, and run 20. Or do we give 80% of the time back to people? And that's more of the conversation I'm having is yeah. if we can automate more of your work, if we can automate things and get better at things like matching and sourcing and uh, matching and sourcing and messaging and marketing um, through automation, uh, give people a much better candidate experience. Deliver people the right content, so we're ending, with, ending up with the right, with a much smaller number of applicants. What would recruiting look like? And, and, I, and I believe what we do is, you know, I, I started a long time ago, even pre-fax machine, when I started out as a recruiter. Um, we didn't have a lot of people in the pipeline at any one time, and it was a much more personal experience. And I think that's really where we're going. 
in the personalization is using automation to give people time back to do the things actually that recruiters want to do and find interesting. Um, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing more of that, uh, which is why I'm encouraging people to do it. I'm also seeing the fear, as we see in a lot of trades, that actually if a machine starts doing the sorting, the shortlisting, um, moving people to shortlist, if all that is done in an automated or AI way, do I actually trust that? I think the other, the other fear we have is if the AI we're using is based on a biased data set, it makes the result data. Do we necessarily know what good luck looks like? So do we know what we want to come as an outcome of an algorithm? There's a whole other another webinar on that topic, but that, that's certainly one I'm thinking. Lex, any questions coming in or? Um, yeah, let me take a look. Actually, just closed the pane. I did not mean to do that. Um, let's just move forward so that way I'm not si I'm sitting here looking through them. <laughs> <laughs> or we can come back for them. So the very last question, which is the big one, that's just what all organizations are asking, Mike, are we actually getting bang for our buck now? Or how do we actually measure measure whether what we're doing in our marketing activity is actually working? Yep. Yeah, so that that's a huge, huge part of what we do, obviously. And, and we've spent a lot of time and resources in ensuring that uh, understanding you know what the bang is right and making sure that our clients understand what are those key performance uh, indicators that uh, at the end of the day are we are we trying to solve for you know with our marketing and how are we gonna judge the success so you have to have um, you know some of the practical things sorted out so the tracking me mechanisms certainly in the technology that powers that and making sure that uh, you know there, there are no gaps in data and ensuring that the data is carried consistently across all channels that typically is a very common challenge um, that our clients come to us with when um, they're using disparate systems that aren't connected from a data perspective so um, I, I think the technology piece is a huge part of, of understanding what the ROI is um, a lot of our clients that engage with us that haven't worked with us before um, have frankly really antiquated ways to track their ROI and it's incredible to us because you know uh, they spend a lot of money on recruiting and recruitment marketing and that has steadily risen as well since the economy has gotten better uh, just with the overall competition for talent so we start by educating our clients on uh, how, how to track to begin with uh, and how that works and why it's important uh, and then from there, we help them goal set and establish what those key metrics are. That yeah. uh, so, if you were telling people involved. up front, and you were giving kind of a, um, a, a, we don't have enough time. We need a whole webinar on it. But as a one hundred and one, what are the things you think people should be should be tracking as a starter to understand their ROI properly? Well, they should you know track you know especially with with any sort of paid paid marketing paid media. Uh, they should be tracking the reach and they should be tracking the response and they should be tracking the response all the way through to hire to con conversion which is to us to apply and then ultimately to hire so they should be able to uh, track every single hire that they possibly can uh, that they're making as a result of whatever investment that they're making uh, back to that specific source at a, at a very fundamental level um, from there they should be able to track what the contributing events or sources are that lead to that hire. So, and we call okay, that. Let, let me ask, let me ask you a question on that because I know this yep. is one that I hear regularly um, from recruiters. Um, when we look at source of hire, I think the source of hire reports in terms of attribution. Uh, very often we're seeing social media, um, social media, featuring quite low in that attribution. So when we look at source of hire it might look as low as three or four percent and that's usually only attributed because the last click was from say a tweet or a Facebook post that's directly right. the apply um, and yet when we're, we're looking at other data from other people it's telling us yeah um, including independent sources like the Canada Experience Awards are saying you know anything up to 80 percent of candidates are looking at social media in in their application 
yeah, in their application drive. process. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and it, so those two numbers don't tie together. Yeah. Um, because one says, well, if it's three or four percent that you're hiring, what's the point of that? Might as well just carry on posting ads. On the other hand, the job seekers are saying, yeah, I'm looking at that and it's influencing my choice. So how do we get a real picture of what I call not return on investment, but return on influence for the for your branding and social media activity, how, how, what do you look at to figure out actually that result we did hires? Well, and again, it gets back to the technology, and, and we're we're kind of leaders in that that type of technology, frankly. So it's it's called uh, multiple event attribution, or having uh, tracking mechanisms or tags that are able to track the user wherever they go, and to to be able to track that event data pipeline and not just that last click that you mentioned. So that's that really is kind of best in class again in the consumer world today when, when really determining what influences buyers and that's what we're doing uh, on the recruitment side as well. And are we seeing um, any particular trends coming out of that where you're saying right okay this seems to be, this is a general trend you think is worth sharing with, with the people listening in, interested in recruitment marketing? Well, I mean, it, it gets back to your point about social. Social is now um, appearing in that pipeline so people can, can have visibility into the effects of social because most social strategies are not to drive people to apply. I mean, that's that's not really kind of our approach to social, and it, and it really shouldn't be anyone's. I mean, it should be more as part of that, that interest generation, branding, engagement, all that good stuff. Um, so that's one thing that we're seeing, and, and then obviously, uh, the impact that that Google is having, that search is having at at the forefront, um, and also repeat visits to careers website and the ability to retarget people uh, with ads that have that have you know gone to your careers website but haven't applied and and using retargeting to really kind of close the deal so to speak. So the importance of retargeting, the importance of social, the importance of Google, those are kind of three. Uh, things that are, are being confirmed by, by having that additional level of data. Excellent. So, um, you know, as a starter for 10, uh, again, how can, how, how can somebody without all the tech and all the budget, how can they track this? What sort of things should they be looking at? In terms of, of how to get it off the ground or? Well, just how to start tracking and properly understanding what's happening with their social accounts rather than, rather than hit, hitting it in hope, I guess. Well, I, you know, I mean, it, it is very sophisticated, so I, th I think you do need to, to lean on professionals and, and companies that can provide that. Um, it, it's not, frankly, something that, you know, the average person off the street can, can implement themselves unless they really know what they're doing. and. Um, are, are being guided and consulted with. Um, but, you know, there is base level data that, that most people can collect uh, using things like source codes, which is a little bit more of a, an antiquated way to, to track people because it does require people to click and you do lose people if they break that apply string or URL. So, you know, our best advice is to consult with people who are experts in this field and, and like us. <laughs> if I'm going to throw a little plug out there, uh, and, and to really get kind of a non-biased, objective viewpoint on on where they should start and what they should do. Yeah, and I, I think it is back to that point of if you if you don't think about anything else, think about source code. So uh, we're coming towards the end of the the webinar, but do we have a one last question, Lex? You want to you want to run by us? Uh, people were actually just asking a lot of, they were asking a lot more questions about getting more bang for your buck. So if you guys just want to round it out on that, I think that'd be perfect. Okay, any, any particular question or, or Mike, do you want to add anything on bang for your buck? I, you know, equally as important as the tracking mechanisms, it's, it's obviously what do we do with the data, right? So take some care into uh, determining what your, your, your data visualization strategy is, how you're going to act on the data, how you're going to socialize the data internally. That's an, an equally important component. It's not just about collecting, but it's also uh, ensuring that everyone understands it is a process of learning and it is something that we need to ha have a strategy behind in terms of how we're going to evaluate this data and how we're not going to hopefully make snap decisions on it but but evaluate it over time and make well-informed decisions based on, on what the data is telling us. Excellent. 
Excellent. So uh, I think we've just about come to the, uh, the the end of our time now. So any, any one of those questions we didn't get to answer, um, we didn't get to answer, we'll try and come back to you and, uh, and round those up and, uh, and let's all, all let us have those. Mike, thanks for joining me in this conversation. Anything you want to add as a closing point and, and how can people get in touch with you if they've got more specific questions? No, I mean, just again, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Bill and Lex. I had a great time talking about this as, as we were talking the other day. You know, we can talk about this all day, but um, you can find me on uh, symphonytalent.com on uh, the, the leadership team page, and, and please add me to your LinkedIn. Reach out. I'd love to talk to, you, to anyone about this type of stuff. It's something that I really uh, am passionate about and enjoy talking about. That's brilliant. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Um, I've been Bill Borman. Thanks, Mike, for your time. Thanks, Simply, for being sponsors. Um, catch us again in, in the social channels or back on the next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care.